begin the adventure on a warm early autumn evening. The winter's frost has not yet settled this year just yet, mainly because there are two stars that orbit Lorraine and the world, Arvino and Elisis. Arvino is a bright blue star and Elisis, the sister star, is a bright red orange star. The seasons are a little bit longer and the winters are a little bit shorter because of this. Many of you are traveling towards Arcanine, Lorraine's central city, where Declan, the Grand Master of Magic, sealed magic away and ended the Great War of Magic nearly 500 years ago. A festival is held in Arcanine every year in remembrance of this day. Many of you were sent to represent your city or town in this festival as your caravans or parties get closer to Arcanine. You can smell crisp honey brew being made. Honey brew is the local brewery in Arcanine. It, a delicious human made brew. To most, it would get you drunk in just a couple bites. In a few, like some of our fellow adventurers here today, you could drink 30 and not get drunk. <laughs> you could hear bards and bands playing in the town center from nearly a half day's travel away. You could tell that most of the realm is here in Arcanine and in around the area setting up camps to celebrate this year's festival. We begin today's adventure with Grigor Kulinov, who arrived nearly a day early from the town of Eden. You've traveled with two clerics who work in the temple you represent, the Temple of Pelor, the god of the sun and agriculture. Eden was only two towns over and only took about a week's worth of travel on horseback, and, and you guys traveled hard on horseback to get here. Gregor, we get a sense that you don't really like to lollygag on the roads. The Temple of Pelor was chosen to represent the Lord of Air, uh, which is one of the six realms of magic on Lorraine this year at the festival. It's been picked for nearly a decade and for centuries before that. Um, Pelor is a symbol of faith. As, as you see, your clerics and yourself are wearing uh, symbols, necklaces, uh, jewelry, even some bracelets. Um, the symbol of faith is a six-pointed star, and in the, in the town of Eden, nearly every door has a six-pointed star on the outside. Because of this, and because the Lord of Error is very religious on Lorraine, the Temple of Pelor and your temple was picked to... Uh, be represented for the Lord of Air at this year's festival in Arcanine. There are many gods worshipped in Elios, uh, which is the world's name, but on Lorraine, the most favored god is Pelor. Uh, Grigor, can you please describe yourself for all of us? Vigilant, determined, and righteous. How would you see your character looks? Very brawn, tall, muscular, and full of shining armor. Okay. So, Grigor is a very polished man. Again, likes to be very vigilant, um, as Grigor has, has said. Um, you know, he likes to get down to business, and he believes he is very righteous. Um, well, Grigor, you find yourself on this early autumn morning, um, evening in Arcanine's Temple of Pelor. Uh, it's very quaint compared to Eden's temple. Um, Arcanine is not very religious, but seeing as it's a human dwelling, a uh, human city, they do have a temple though, uh, because uh, Pelor is the, the god worshiped among humans um, on Lorraine. Um, now, it's the only sacred building in this town, so that's why you're here. Uh, you notice uh, local uh, breweries around are filled with drunks and sinners kind of disgust you a little bit um, however you understand the times are needing for drunks and sinners because you're at a festival but you find yourself in the temple um, simply because that's where you find yourself more accepted now while speaking with a local cleric a hooded figure is sitting in the furthest pew from the pedestal in that temple pillar. Um it's closest to the door but the figure is kind of in the shadows but in the corner now this figure you can't see much of this figure but all you can hear from the corner is the lore is a fake god you know what do you do approach the figure cautiously the, the figure stands up and kind of 
circles the pews, um, so you can't really get close to the figure. Um, you know, kind of strategically getting distance away from you as they walk around the outside of the temple, of the outside of the pews and the inner side of the temple. I said Pelor is a fake god. Pelor cannot give light where darkness is born. Now, I want you to make a perception check to, to see if you know what this figure is. So please roll the first d20 of this game. How? Do you have a dice? I thought there was dice in Forge. So there are. Um, so here's what we'll do. I can roll a d20 for you if you'd like, or we can go ahead and walk through on how to roll. How do I roll on here? So you can go down and click, let me just check, go to your character on your screen. So you click Gr uh, Grigor Kolonov. And you will go ahead and click a perception down there on the character street. Do you see where it says perception, wisdom plus two, twelve? Okay. Go ahead and click normal for me. Like I just did. Alright, so you rolled a five. So if everyone followed, that's how you will make rolls in game. You are allowed to use your own dice. I understand we're all from home these days. So you're still allowed to use your, your favorite dice from home. If you don't have them, you can click them just like Record did. Um, so you rolled a five. Now you can see that this figure is very, very dark skinned. Now, not of a different race dark skin, but we're talking like it's marble purple black skin. Now you have never seen a creature with marble purple black skin, um, but what you can see is that this figure has some pendant that resembles a spider. Um, could you please now give us a d20 religion check? Eleven. Alright, so you have no idea uh, what this pendant is. You're a very religious man, um, however you can tell that this pendant is a religion that you do not know. Um, so, with that being said, you are still trying to get closer to this figure, correct? Correct. Now, this figure looks at you, notices that you're actually gaining ground, and uh, goes, We'll be back for you soon. Enjoy the festival, paladin. And as the last paladin falls off this figure's tongue, she steps back into the shadow and disappears. Now you can feel free to come up and do what you want, try to investigate, try to figure out, see if anyone saw anything. At this point, you can start role playing. If not, we can we can keep going. I would like to roll another perception check. I will give you another perception check. A nine, unfortunately. Um, you don't see how this figure got out. You are looking in that shadow area, and all you feel is dark wall, um, or cold stone wall. You have no idea how this figure got out. You don't know who this figure was. You do know that the voice was slightly feminine, so you can be assumptive in saying that this was um, some type of female. Um, but all you saw was marble black skin, and a black purple skin, and a pendant in the shape of a spider. Now, we're going to move over now from Kerbag to the local bar where most of the festivities are taking place, as well as most of the noise. Um, the local bar owner's name is Mira. Slender woman, blonde hair, and dark green eyes, and absolutely beautiful. Most of the people in this bar are pining over Mira as she is moving between tables, trying to delegate as much as she can to her staff, pouring drinks, um, and overall, feeding and enter entertaining customers. Now, uh, in the corner of this bar is a our very own hulking green orc, Kerbag. Uh, Kerbag, please describe yourself to us. I am big. I am strong. I, I can't hear you, Kerbag. Please speak up. Sorry. I am big, I am strong, and I don't have any armor on. 
All right. How would you say that you act? Um, give us a little description of some in, some insight to your character and how they behave. If something is small, I crush it. If somebody can get screwed over, I love it. All right. So we have um, our, our little evil orc who is not so little. Um, he, <coughs> hates young, he hates little people. Um, mainly because things that we'll have to discuss in the future. Well, hopefully will Jake will uh, let us know or Kerbag will let us know. Um, and he is, um, for the most part, not geared and apparently topless uh, at our bar in the corner. <laughs> now, Kerbag, you came here to Arcanine on foot. Uh, the roads to Arcanine, even from the island of Drenoth, which is um, where the Lord of Fire uh, built up his kingdom, they're generally safe. Uh, but any bandits that would have looked at you while you're walking on the road would have concluded that it was a bad idea to rob you. Um, you stand pretty tall, um, almost seven foot tall. Uh, you sit here at the bar in the corner by yourself, being avoided by most simply because orcs don't venture this far and are usually aggressive in nature. Now, there have there has been peace for about 500 years, but orcs will still raid human, human cities um, simply because they're more evil in nature. Um, you were chosen as the champion of Drenoth and the Lord of Fire in a brawling tournament you won about six months ago. Um, you were very scarred by orcs um, of your clan. Um, they love wearing their scars as achievements and trophies. Uh, they've scarred over. You let them scar over. Um, but your opponents were much less fortunate of you. That's why you got picked to be the champion of Drenoth this year. Um, what you're doing at this bar right now is trying to get tipsy from the alcohol, the honey brew that humans can muster up. You are having no success. Your metabolism is just burning right through you, and you aren't getting drunk at all. You're at your 13th pint, um, and we're only midday at this point. Um, and you're actually at this point getting distracted by a, um, a bard that's playing a leer on stage. Um, at this point, we are going to move over uh, really quickly to Serenity. Um, can you describe yourself for us, please? I have a very delicate face. My eyes are piercing blue, like the ocean. My hair is long, beautiful, flowing, and blonde. And I'm wearing a amazing frilly dress. Awesome. Um, now, you're playing on stage right now. What would you say that we're seeing? What is your performance? What would you naturally be doing on stage to impress an audience? I would be belting out the greatest songs that I've heard in my past adventures. I would sing them very lightly and I would be engaging the audience while dancing very slowly around the stage. Absolutely beautiful. In fact, it's so beautiful right now that most of the people in the bar have stopped admiring Mira and drinking and eating what's on their table, but they're actually staring at you and they're mesmerized. They actually can't move. Um, every word that you speak seems to leave everyone wanting more, and they're absolutely drawn in. In fact, even Kerbag in the corner starts realizing that he can't take his eyes off of you. Kerbag, can you please roll a d20 charisma saving throw for us? Already. Charisma saving throw. All right, so we have an eight. Um, now, with with an eight, uh, you 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 fail. You you absolutely do not break free of this of this trance. Um, you are surprised that a human uh, can attract you so much that leaves you in your seat, unable to move. Um, now, you don't want to get out of your seat. Don't think of this as like you are stuck, but you are sitting there absolutely almost on the verge of tears to this music. Um, now, you do notice yourself mesmerized. What would you think Kerbag would be doing right now? Hmm. Kerbag thinks he would want to take out his bagpipes and play along. Okay. So Kerbag is now going to, um, I'm assuming, get on stage? Or what, are you going to play at your own booth or are you going to get on stage? Uh, uh, I think I would get on stage knowing Kerbag. All right, so now we have Serenity playing a Lear, and uh, Kerbag now 
stomping through this bar, getting on stage, um, and absolutely devastating every table around him on his way up because his, I mean, his feet are like the size of most people's heads. So now he's playing the bagpipes. It sounds like a, like a, a terrible funeral um, from one side. And then you have this beautiful music that makes you want to cry on the other end of the stage. Um, most people really love the music that you guys are playing, mostly because Serenity, Kerbag. I, I apologize. So, Kerbag, understand. <laughs> as you guys are playing music, you guys have gone through a few songs now. You guys are really nicely bouncing off each other. Uh, Mira in the back has uh, been able to get a, a bit of a break, and most of the staff has really gotten uh, back on foot uh, with what they were going through because there's a lot of people in town right now. This 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 pub is absolutely like packed, except for where your table was because no one wants to go to where you were. Um, at this point, the bar slams open, and the bar slams open, um, and standing in the doorway is a tall human man in full plate armor with dark brown hair going down to his back. It's about halfway down to his back. So he's he's got long brown hair. Um, and he's got this full grown brown beard. Uh, you would you would think of him as a dwarf except for he's a human, which is strange. Mira, one brew for me and one for the dwarf. Pushing past the full plated human is nearly a five foot tall dwarf. Most dwarves are not this tall. Um, but you can tell that he, he's not um, a dwarf that would stand or ground because those dwarfs are typically smaller. He's more of a hill dwarf that would remain in the hills. They're, they get they get a bit a bit tall. He's dressed in chainmail. He's got a bow on his back and a battle axe on his side. I don't know what you're brewing here, but I'm gonna need two lassie. Mira, she she looks at them. Sheriff Donning, I expected you to be sober tonight. No issues, I take it. No, ma'am. The droves have not even shown up yet, I doubt they come. They haven't even shown up in years. Good riddance. At this point, Serenity has stepped off stage. Um, Kerbag is as well. You guys are pretty much done. Most of the people are, are back to what they're doing. Um, but both Serenity and Kerbag have kind of sat back down at the booth. Um, their kind of mutual friendship has allowed Kerbag to gain some type of friend to sit at, the, at his booth with him. Um, now, Kerbag... You see this dwarf, and um, this is the first, by the way, and this will come in play later. This is the first uh, short person that you've seen since walking on the roads. In fact, you don't see many dwarfs um, or gnomes, halflings of any sort, between the Lord of Fire, the island of Drunoth, and Arcanine. Um, now, your muscles start to tense up your your fists ball up in rage your muscles are pulsing up and down you get a flashback to your childhood um, and you feel like you're on fire your muscles are popping the heat in the room has gone up and you're sweating your vision dims and you can only focus on this dwarf serenity you see Kerbag's reaction to this dwarf um, what are you going to do I'm going to try to calm Kerbag down. Okay. Um, let's go ahead and make opposing D20 checks to see what happens. So I need both Kerbag and Serenity to roll a D20. Now, I will allow Serenity to roll a D20 in front of me because she's right here. And she rolled a 16. Kerbag, go ahead and roll a standard D20. Uh, and you can just roll that in front of you. Alrighty. <coughs> Sorry. Give me one second. Seven. Okay, so Serenity wins. Um, she is able to to calm you down. Um, she's able to get you out of this uh, dimmed tunnel vision state of anger, and she pull, she she's able to pull you over to the booth so you can actually make sense of what's going on. Um, now Sheriff Donning also notices uh, your reaction to the dwarf. Ox's name. My name's Donning. How about yours? Kerbag. Oh, okay, Kerbag. Well, I'm Donning. This is my uh, friend, Thorn. Uh, he comes up from the uh, kingdom of Earth, uh, you know, Lord of Earth's kingdom. Um, and we don't take too kindly to what you're doing right now. Uh, we're pretty accepting for, uh, uh, for a town in the human kingdom. Uh, you're going to have to get used to seeing shorter people here. 
know what, this is going to be hard. <laughs> well, we can't have you running around here. Um, now, you're, you, you, you can't be running around here being angry at, at this dwarf or other dwarves or gnomes. I mean, you're going to run into bad news. Uh, you're here on behalf of uh, Drenoth, I take it. Yes. You see, here, it don't matter if you're green, brown, tall, or short. We're all the same. Can I offer you pint? Mira, pint for the orc. Now, Sheriff Donning point, uh, puts a pint in your hand. Drink up. I'll see you in an hour at the departure. And at this point, Sheriff Donning slams this pint in your hand, um, <laughs> just expects you to drink it, and just walks out, and uh, Thorn follows him out. Um, now, on the way out, Serenity kind of gets charmed by Sheriff Donning. Sheriff Donning is a pretty attractive man. Um, you know, he's got that flowing dark brown hair. Um, you know, beautiful, again, dark eyes. Um, at, at this point, he's like, on the way out, he's like, oh my, look at the time, I gotta go, be seeing ya, and he winks at Serenity as he hurries out of the bar. Now, with that being said, Kerbeck and Serenity, they're generally in a better spot, Thorns out of the bar, um, and now Kerbeck has more control of his senses, now that there's no um, dwarves or gnomes in the bar. We're going to move out just to the edge of Arcanine. Um, in the woods just outside the town, near an old broken down guard tower, as you guys can see on our maps. Let's go ahead and load that up for everyone to see. You'll see that now there's a there's that broken down guard tower in the, in the top left. Um, at this time of day, uh, it's it's gone by a few hours um, since the incident with Kerbag Serenity and uh, the dwarf Thorn. Um, it's so dark and the woods are so thick that you can almost not see the the broken down guard tower, and you can almost not see into the woods. There's no sunlight reaching the floor of this forest. Uh, you can pretty easily hear the commotions of town from here, but it's pretty dimmed off. Again, it, it's it's a it's a, about a mile away from town at this point, maybe half a mile. Um, on the bottom of the guard tower is a slight hill, um, and it's just, again, far enough where most of the residents look like ants, so you can't really make out any figures here. Um, now, we are going to um, have a figure enter in for most of us, and this will make sense in just a moment. Um, it is a very dark-skinned, dark black purple um, woman with silvery white hair, um, about down to her shoulders. And she looks over at another um, dark marbled uh, black purple skin, um, the same kind of elven features, silvery hair, but it's much shorter. The second, um, at this point, dark elf uh, will have shorter hair, almost kind of like, uh, you know, spiked up uh, short tomboy hair, if we want to say that. And she looks over, the first lady, uh, she says, Did you steal the cleric's relic, Zestra? Zestra looks at the uh, Zalindra, the first dark elf, and says, They wouldn't just hand it over, so I took a little more than just a relic. They're both very slender, and when she says that she took a little bit more than just the relic, she looks down at this beautiful ebony knife, and there's just blood dripping down it. They're all going to die in the end anyways. Both of these droll women, uh, dark elf women, now look over at now our final adventurer, Nameless. Please describe yourself to the rest of us. So she can't uh, talk super loud. So I will speak for her. Okay. Nameless is tall, slender, obviously purple skinned, and has. As a robe that encompasses her whole body. Okay. Um, so, um, with that, Nameless is the third dark elf that is at the edge of the woods now. They can't be seen. In fact, you probably couldn't see them if you were standing 10 feet away from them. They blend right into the darkness and they're almost undetectable. Um, again, we now we have Zalindra, Zestra, and Nameless. Um, Zestra looks over to Nameless and says, you wouldn't be having any second thoughts, would you, Nameless? Now, hearing them call you Nameless makes you flinch. 
um, you didn't choose to be without a house. In the Dark Elf Kingdom, the Drow Kingdoms, being part of a house is one of the most important things. Outside of being um, a woman in the Dark Elf community, the next best thing is being part of a house. Um, for as long as you can remember, you have not been part of any house. You were never given any name, and so you are an outcast among all Dark Elves, um, and they call you nameless. Um, you, you have no idea if your parents are still alive, who your father and mother was, if they're still alive. All you know is that these two dro took you off the street. They gave you, um, they told you that they would give you the ability to get your mother back. Um, go ahead and role play what you would be saying to these two Dark Elves right now, asking me if you would have any second thoughts. Nameless says, why would you think such a thing? Well, it wouldn't matter if you did or didn't. It's the main event is already underway. We just have to make sure that your loyalties lie to the Dark Elves. Now, Nameless, uh, Nameless, I need you to roll a perception check for me. All right, so we have 24. Um, so you see Zalindra uh, behind Zestra snap a golden pendant um, in the shape of a sun. Again, it's that six-pointed sun. You see a pendant. She snaps it in half. Um, she throws it into a bowl um, filled with red liquid and several other objects. You, you can't make most of them out, but you can tell that there's a coral crown made of some type of material from the ocean, um, a necklace of wolf teeth, um, and a, a carved stone. Um, and there's a few other objects, but... Uh, before you can tell what they all are, um, they're all burned away. Um, Zestra, or sorry, Zalindra, um, immediately starts a fire and it burns out in a, a, a bright heap. It's very noticeable since you're in, in darkness, but before the fire can really be, be seen, the fire dies out and all the objects are um, completely gone. Um, so is the red liquid that filled this bowl. And now they, she looks at you. Nameless, you stay here and keep an eye out for the uh, oaf of a sheriff. He's going to be coming now that there was a fire, but you shouldn't have a problem. And before you can react, both Zalindra and Zestra melt in the shadows and are gone. You absolutely, you do not see where they're going, um, and you have no idea what they're going to do at this point because they didn't tell you. Nearly an hour passes by, and uh, they have not returned. Um, and you hear a twig snap behind you. Um, I need you to roll another perception check for me. All right, so we have a six, um, and that's a natural one, by the way, because you had a plus five. So you fail. You absolutely do not catch whatever broke this twig, um, and you have no idea what the sound was. You're kind of looking around, and you have no idea what's going on. After a few seconds, you realize that right in your face is Sheriff Donning, um, and now, now that they're right in front of you, Sheriff goes and uh, pulls out his longsword. Um, he says, well, I reckon. Uh, why are you hiding in these woods? Uh, you're far less safe here in, uh, than in town, I say. Hey, say, you're a dark elf. I haven't, it's been years since I've seen one of your kind. Uh, some would say you're up to no good out here by yourself. Um, at, the last, at the last word that he mutters, because he's, he said, uh, you're no good hiding out here by yourself. A rapier skewers right through his chest, right in the middle, and he is dead. Um, blood is now pouring out of his mouth, and you can hear uh, the sound of his of his hound because he brought a dog with him. You can hear this, <coughs> this, this. It sounds like the bone snapped. And as Sheriff Donning falls to the ground in front of you, um, Zalindra is holding the rapier and pushes him off. And Zestra in the back has her foot on this dog's neck and completely butchered this dog. Um, now, they look at you and they say, Nameless, you disappoint us. How could a human sneak up on you that easily? And at this point, Sheriff Donning's body slams in the ground with a final thud and blood is now just soaking up the grass at your feet. It's getting your boots wet at this point. We need one last thing from you and then we'll give you your mother. We need you to attend this ceremony, Nameless, and it's about to begin. Now, shoo along and wait for a signal. 
with that, they again melt into the darkness. So you have no idea where they went. Um, being part of a, the Drow community, you know that if if a Drow gets into the darkness, um, they will not be found, especially above ground. Um, they they have the ability to be unkingly stealthy. Um, at this point, Sheriff Donning's body and Hound are just dead and lifeless right in front of you. And the torches um, that were on their bodies are kind of scarring the ground as well. So there's some light coming from you now because there's a, a small fire brewing. And you can hear some guards walking up to you. Uh, now they're about a quarter of a mile away and at the edge of the forest. Um, it's just a normal patrol. Um, so they're coming towards you. They can't make you out yet. Um, at this point, the only thing that you can do is attend the ceremony or run. Uh, what do you do? Attend the ceremony. All right. So we now move forward to Declan's departure. Um, Declan's departure, again, Declan is the Grand Wizard of Magic who sealed magic 500 years ago. Um, and there was a building erected around his statue. Whenever, um, whenever Declan sealed magic, him and all of the other lords of magic were sealed into statues. And Declan's statue had a building encompassed around it, and there's a festival around the statue um, every year. Um, now, Declan, uh, he was not much to behold. Uh, you know, he kind of would represent Buddha, where he had the big belly and, um, you know, kind of long grayish hair. Um, but again, this statue, it's made of solid stone, and most of the features are lifeless now. It's pretty worn and torn uh, from how long it's been, because it's been about 500 years at this point. Um, so now all uh, all four of you are now at this um, ceremony, uh, the Declan's departure. Let me go ahead and put you guys on the map real quick so you guys can kind of get a look around. So Kerbag, we'll go ahead and drop you by the, the table of fire and we'll go ahead and put Gregor at the table of earth, um, oh, sorry, table of air. Nameless, you'll go ahead and be at the table of death since typically the Dro kingdom was part of the lord of death's kingdom serenity you'll be at the lord of waters table and most people when you go to the lord of waters table they actually question you because only people of that kingdom are allowed to sit at their table and you're all alone and they're trying to they're kind of puzzled um, because normally the lord of water would not have a human uh, represent them um, so most people kind of give you give you looks around. So you guys at, at this point um, start start to mingle with the crowd. You notice um, uh, that most of the common folk are there. You see Mira there. Um, the bars pretty much moved over to Declan's departure and all the alcohol. Um, and then everyone is there with you guys. Um, so you guys can start mingling around um, with each other. Now, Gore, you don't really know anybody. You know your two clerics. Um, Kerbag, you still know Serenity, but you two really just know each other. And Nameless, you are kind of sitting off at your table um, in the darkness, and no one can really see you yet, um, simply because in the shadow of the, in the darkness, and no one can really see you yet, um, simply because in the shadow of that table, it's not really well lit, and you're at the end of it. Um, so let me go ahead and pull up something real quick for us. So Declan's Departures, it's a massive building. Um, you guys saw this as you entered in. It's a huge tower, the tallest building in Arcanine. Um, and the the pillar in the middle, you can tell, is is the Grand, Grand Wizard uh, Declan himself. As being around it, all four of you can tell that it's got power to it. As you walk around it, you, you feel this power within you kind of start to work its way out. Now, magic has been sealed for about 500 years, and magic has, has been completely gone since. There have been absolutely no one able to control magic. Uh, but you can tell that this statue is magical, um, and you can feel it inside of yourselves. Um, again, there are six tables in this room, as uh, as you can see. As If you guys... Um, let me go ahead and just see if I can help you out. So I'll go ahead and try to move you guys around real quick. Now that's a lot better. Okay. Yeah. Hmm. So I'm just going to move you guys around so you can kind of see the room. 
So can you see all the tables now, Kerbag? Yes. All right, I'll go ahead and do the same with everybody. Can So as you guys are, of course, moving around the room, you know, people are greeting you and asking you questions about your heritage and where you guys are from. Um, so right now, uh, Gregor, you kind of bump into Kerbag. Um, and Kerbag is right now with Serenity kind of having a drink, and they're really to themselves right now. So go ahead and uh, introduce yourself. What, what would you do in front of a seven-foot orc? Let me move myself down to Serenity. Okay. Uh, I'm not able to... There we go. I'm trying to move myself down to... Yep, there we go. I got you. Yep. In order to remain my dignity, I walk straight up to Kerbag, and I ask him, where are you from? I am from the Fire Isles. Where are you from, cutie human? I do not respond to Kerbag. <laughs> not to offend, but to be more inquisitive, and I ask, what religion do you follow? Can you give me five seconds? I completely forget. Uh... No, you're okay. So the um, the Lord of Fire was actually um, he was his name was uh, Grumish, uh, which is the basically the leader of all the orcs civilization, and that is basically your god is uh, again Grumish, uh, Grumish. Uh, so you, you can tell him that you, that you worship uh, Grumish as an orc. Um, and that's the only person that the orc kingdom would even think about worshipping. Yes. I worship Grumish. I turn to my head to the side and I mutter, unfortunate. And then I walk away from him. <laughs> Alright, so um, at this point, Gore leaves, uh, leaves Kerbag um, now. Kerbag's pretty used to, to people avoiding him. Like his, again, he's a, a huge, almost seven-foot-tall orc in a place where they rarely see orcs. Um, now, again, we have Serenity at the water table. Um, we have a lot of elves at the table of life. Um, now, no one really pays attention to the elves. They, they kind of they keep to themselves. They couldn't care less about this festival, but they're there because they have to be there. Um, the Lord of Earth's table... Um, is actually filled with a lot of dwarfs. There's a there's a couple of gnomes there, halflings, um, and for the most part, very worked looking people. Um, they they're just covered in dirt. They did not get ready for this. Um, it looks like they they just came out of a coal mine and then sat down at a table. So um, not much there. There's there's about four people at that table. Um, but Kerbag, you don't really notice them. Uh, you don't really care because they're on the opposite side of the room at this point from you. And uh, right now you're kind of just still stuck kind of within Serenity. You, you kind of look at her and you just can't keep your eyes off Serenity. And um, at this point, Serenity is being avoided by most people because no one understands why she's at the table of water. Um, now... Everyone assumes that there's no one at the Lord of Death's table, um, but Nameless, we know Nameless is there. Um, she is attending the ceremony. Um, at one point, uh, there's some music playing on stage, and a couple entertainers are uh, throwing around fire beams. They're kind of like juggling them like little pillars of fire. And at, at one point, there's so much light in the room that um, you can actually see into the Lord of Death's table, and everyone notices that there's a figure sitting at this table. Again, it's been a, almost a century since the Lord of Death has ever even attended this ceremony, um, simply because the Lord of Death was the big villain in the Lord in, in the War of Magic. Uh, almost everyone immediately stops what they're doing. Even the entertainers see you, and uh, they they notice that you're there, and for a minute you have a sense like you're in danger because everyone is looking at you and thinking about what's wrong here. And after that split second, 
um, a, a nobleman gets up on the bar in front of everybody, and uh, you could tell he's the richest man in town simply because he is in fine silk robes. He's got golden necklaces. He's very well groomed compared to everyone else. Um, he looks very modern compared to everyone else, and he's welcome all. I'm pleased to see familiar faces and new faces this year. A joyous occasion is this. We are all descendants of the great Grand Wizard Declan. He himself sealed magic and saved our world of destruction. Um, it is he who brought peace so that you and I can live without fear of knives in our backs or teeth in our necks. Drink up and make tonight a night you will never forget. Um, and he jumps down from the bar. Uh, you can tell he was slightly enthused, but could really care less. He, he had better things to do. He steps down from the bar, and he starts talking with Mira, um, who's at the bar handing out drinks, and is not paying attention to anybody else. Um, and now a few faces look back at Nameless, um, and it's like, Table of Death, is that a dro? And you hear whispering between people, psh, 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 I've never seen one before. What's going on? They haven't attended. Is something wrong? Are we in danger? Um, Grigor, you get this feeling that something is wrong. Now, generally within your faith, you have a sense of, um, of like danger, so you can sense danger uh, or that something's wrong, and you can basically sense evil. Um, and you sense that there's evil coming from that, that table of death. The two clerics that traveled with you, they have not shown up to this temple. They have not shown up to the departure. Uh, for some reason, you've been all alone. Again, they're the only two people that you knew. Um, so your, your clerics are late. You don't know what's going on. Uh, you know that they should either be in the temple or they should be in the room behind your temple, uh, behind your table, since there's uh, quarters there for the people to sleep, have private parties in, uh, mingle with themselves. Um, you can tell that the, the table of life with all the elves, they left the room and they went to their own private little gathering because they could not care less about anybody else. But for you, you're all alone and you're worried that now your clerics still have not shown up and it's been hours. Um, what what do you do? I go over to the table where Nameless is at. Of course, not too close as to be cautious. And inquisitively, I roll a perception check. Alright, um, go ahead and give us a perception check. Alright, so you rolled a four. Um, you, you don't notice much uh, but what you do notice is that this is not the same figure that you that you saw before um, it's completely different uh, you know nameless has completely different clothing um, the figure that you saw was in dark leather uh, and had a leather hood over her face um, and you saw strands of white hair um, however nameless is much different it looks like she's in a very dark robe um, and is completely concealed but does not have the same the same hair color it's it's uh, a little bit more white compared to the other one was a little bit more silverish. Um, but one thing that you do notice is that the door behind your table is actually unlocked and it's uh, slightly open. I change my direction, my, my point of view, and I go over to my table and I decide to roll another perception check closer to the door. Okay. Give us a perception check. All right, so you rolled a 19. So you notice at your door, um, the lock appears to be broken um, at this point. It, it looks like whoever's working it. I um, mean, these are very primitive locks. Um, they have a couple different keyholes on them. So you have to have multiple keys in order to unlock them. Um, it looks like whoever worked this lock just decided to break it instead of uh, being able to pick it. Uh, but you do notice that there is darkness in the room. Uh, so whoever went into that room um, unlit the torches. Um, you see the doors unlocked, uh, but that's what you see. So, yeah, go ahead. What do you do? I proceed to go through the door. Okay. So you grab the torch that is currently on the table um, of of the uh, air, and you you open up the door. And as you open up the door, um, you see body parts all over the room. Uh, you see arms on one side of the room. 
you see legs on the other. There's blood everywhere, up and down the walls, the upholstery. Um, you see entails everywhere on the floor, and it looks like there's been a slaughter. Uh, what you can tell is that some of the shreds of clothing around these uh, bodies that are completely mangled everywhere, um, they're white robes with uh, golden uh, wrappings. And you would notice that these are the same clothes that your clerics uh, came down uh, to Arcanine with. Is it possible to roll medicine? Um, I will. You cannot bring these people back to life. I mean, there's their bodies are gone. They, they. It looks like whoever killed them was very skilled with a blade and simply chopped them into itty bitty pieces with a few strokes. Um, so medicine checks won't work. I, if you want to do anything, you can do an investigation check. Before I do anything, and before I desecrate the body in any way, shape, or form, I pray over their bodies. Okay. I appreciate that. Um, a absolutely. So what would you say the prayer of Pelor would be? Again, Pelor is the um, god of sun and god of agriculture. That the god of sun gives light to the path to the world up above so that they are not dismayed in any way. Okay. I appreciate the, the role play. So here's what we're going to do for um, very accurate role play for what your character is. Um, I'm going to give you an inspiration. So um, you can only have one inspiration at a time, and each character can have one inspiration. Um, so as people role play, they'll get um, awarded an inspiration. Um, you can use this to give yourself um, an advantage role at any time. So. Uh, let's say that you didn't like one roll that you had. At this point, you could use the inspiration I'm giving you, and you could re-roll. Um, I really, like, praying over the dead bodies is absolutely something that you would have done. All right, so um, you pray over these bodies. Um, you get this sense of uh, completion in their lives. Um, you sense that their spirits are moving on, um, and, and definitely to a better place. Um, so go ahead and give me an uh, investigation check to see what you can find out. You gave me a six. Uh, unfortunately, you don't you don't really notice anything. Um, you don't notice anything missing. You don't notice any kind of specific marks in the body. You just kind of look at the wounds and you think it was a sword, but you can't tell if it was like a, a rapier, a short sword, um, a dagger. You can't really tell anything. All you can really tell is that they were brutally murdered um, and that there's absolutely no way for them to, to come back. Now, in the common room, Everyone is suddenly quiet behind you. Um, everyone else in the common room starts to hear a faint crack. Like like something is kind of giving. And it slowly starts growing. Uh, you, the crack all of a sudden starts turning into some dust falling from the ceiling. Um, everyone in the main room right now, and Gregor, right now you're not in the main room this second. Um, everyone in the main room looks up and sees this pillar. Um, there's a crack in the top of it, and it, it's starting to move down. Um, it's small chunks of this stone is plummeting to the floor, and the statue is fairly big. Um, it, it's about 30 feet tall, um, and you, you can tell when, whenever it was, it was made, uh, it was carved to be that way. Not that any kind of uh, humans were 30 feet tall in the past, uh, but you can tell that this was kind of a memorabilia statue made around the statue of Declan. Um, so you notice that this pillar, um, this statue is breaking, and so is the remaining part of the roof um, around all the tables, and the walls start to crack too. So everything is generally breaking, and now wood and stone is falling to the, to the floor, and it's it's smashing down. Chunks of boulders are smashing down. Right next to Kerbag, a large piece of um, stone slams into a woman completely destroys her. Um, you, you don't even hear anything. You hear a slight squeak, and then it sounds like someone stepped in, in like a bowl of grapes. Um, she wasn't able to make it, you know, anything out of it. Um, the general consensus of the room now is running. Um, so everyone, let's let's go ahead and uh, roll d20s for me, uh, and I'll explain in just a moment. Ooh. 
How do I roll a casual d20? Um, let me go ahead and just double check, I think. So go ahead and uh, just pick it. Pick a stat that you have plus zero in. For the time being, just roll that. So you notice on a gore, like your, your arcana is, is, is a zero. So just roll that uh, for the time being. Kerbeck has no weaknesses. <laughs> Not who does name most. Okay, so <laughs> I have an 11 from Gore. I have a 6 from Serenity. Um, what did you get, Jake? I got a 19. 19, okay. Um, and Nameless, um, we're, we'll move to you in a second, but uh, Kerbag, you're you're able to run out of the room fairly easily. Your long strides make you um, a little bit quicker in a sprinting scenario. Um, Gregor, uh, you notice um, that there is a window on the other side of the room that you're in. So when you when you exit the room on the other side, there's a small hallway. You easily manage to jump out of that window um, fairly fairly easily. Um, as for Serenity, rolling a six. At the very last second, you, you're running out of the out of the front door of the room. Um, you don't notice a piece of the pillar falling towards you. Um, you manage to mostly get out of the way. Uh, part of this pillar does scrape your arm, and um, you take about D 2s worth of damage. Um, so we'll we'll calculate that later. It may not make a difference, but because you didn't have time to react, you accidentally push um, a, a civilian, a, a woman with a child, underneath this pillar, and the pillar smashes on top of them and kills them. No. Um, but you're able to get out of the room. Um, again, the side of your shoulder is scraped from the pillar barely grazing you. Uh, Kerbag's out of the room, and uh, so is uh, Gregor. You guys have all made it out safely. Um, Thorn's out as well. Oh, God dang it! What's going on? Um, and at this point, we're going to move over to Nameless. Uh, now, Nameless, you take this as the signal that um, Zastra and Zlindra were giving you. You see a majority of the villagers are now out of the room. Uh, you were generally staying at your table uh, while everyone was running. Go ahead and um, you make an investigation check for me. All right, 14. That is actually just enough. So um, you see behind a rug hanging on the wall in the back, there's a secret door with a handle. And this is the door behind the bar. Um, you can see it's kind of open because it looks like Mira and the noble and uh, uh, anyone by the bar made it out of this. You easily make it out of the, the room by going through the secret door behind the rug. Um, now, as you're going out of this door, you you get stopped. Um, suddenly you get kind of cross-lined, uh, like, a, like an arm comes across your chest and you drop to the ground. Um, the, no one really sees this happen, um, but all you hear is, we didn't think you'd make it out of there. No bother. The villagers will have your neck within an hour. And you notice at the last second, um, what you realize is uh, Zalindra and Zestra are right above you, and Zestra takes out her rapier, and with the palm of the rapier, slams you in the top of the head, um, and you're unconscious. Um, at that point, we're going to take a five-minute break.
break to recap what has just happened. Our four adventurers traveled from distant lands, uh, some as far as other islands, completely dedicated to other nations, to attend an annual festival of champions in remembrance of the Grand Wizard, Declan. During their stay of the festival, there were murders, assassinations, and worst of all, the Pillar of Declan was destroyed. Um, our very own Nameless was knocked out and betrayed, um, and is going to be waking up fairly soon. Uh, now we're going to move, a, it's now morning time, and Nameless, you're coming back to consciousness um, at this point. You have a major migraine. I mean, you were pommeled, and um, had it been any harder, you probably would have died. Uh, but even worse than the migraine, it's daylight outside. Um, dark elves and daylight have a uh, disadvantage to almost every kind of uh, insight check, uh, perception check. Overall, your eyes cannot handle the daylight. And in Lorraine, on Elios, there are two suns, and the days are a little bit longer than what we would normally know as uh, daytime. So at this point, your eyes are they're burning, and you can barely make out anything, um, and almost everything is complete blur to you. Um, you're trying to cover your eyes at this. You're, you're trying to cover your eyes because they hurt. As you're attempting to cover your eyes, you realize that you can't even move your hands, and they're tied behind your back around a wooden post. Um, at this point, you, you're able to look up and you see a very blurry image of uh, another man in, in very heavy, heavy plate armor. You're awake. Uh, you, you look up and he's staring right down at you. His hair is uh, trimmed high and tight, a gentleman's mustache, a nice handlebar mustache and a scar from cheekbone to chin. Names of Nor, you've got some explaining to do. The Pillar of Declan was destroyed a couple of days ago and you just woke up. We've been trying to rescue people from the remains and suddenly we find you in the back, knocked out. There's a bunch of people dead and oh, by all means, there's chaos everywhere. What the hell were you up to? I said, what the hell were you up to? I want to roll in a investigation roll, please. All right. Oh. I will. Does it, does it have to be at disadvantage? Um, I mean, it depends on what are you trying to investigate. How many other people are there besides him? Okay, uh, we'll do perception with disadvantage. So when you're rolling your uh, your check, you'll see that there's a disadvantage box. All right, so you you have a ten, um, so you you can generally make out the room. Um, you notice that at this point, he's by himself. Look, it's going to go much easier if, if we get on a friendly basis. My name's Nor. Again, you got some explaining to do. Uh, we saw two of your kind early in the morning making their way out and running towards Lake Ellentine away from the destruction. We have means to think that you're responsible behind this attack. Many people are dead and you've got some explaining to do. What's your name? I see nothing. He takes off his, his gauntlet. Look, I want to be nice to you. I really do. But if you force my hand, I'm going to have to use other means unnecessarily. Again, I see. All right. Uh, he hits you with his gauntlet. Um, at this point, it's going to do 1d4 uh, damage. He hits you straight across the face. Uh, that's a perfect four amount of damage. Um, so let's go ahead and pull up. Uh, that, that puts you you're at 18 points, but now you're at 14. Look, we could do this the easy way or the hard way. I don't want to have to keep going. I'm just trying to figure out what happened, who was behind this, and what did they want. Can I get your name? I don't have one. What do you mean you don't have a name? You're a dark elf. You guys have 30 names. It's not something you would understand. All right, humor me. What's a nickname people would call you? Nothing. All right, okay, nothing. 
Who were your two friends and why were they running? I don't know what you're talking about. Okay, well, uh, we have guards on the side of the village right now that are pulling up a dead body and uh, a dead dog of the sheriff and his hound. And uh, they was right next to where they were running from. We have means to think that they're in connection with you. So can you just give me a little bit so I can make sure the mob outside the front door don't kill you? Um, I want to roll a persuasion roll, please. Uh, a what roll? Mm -hmm. Intimidation? Persuasion. Persuasion. Sure, go oh. ahead. Well, what what do you want to persuade? Oh, I want him to believe it's a mark. That you know. Yeah. Well, how do you want the roll? Uh, you just roll the persuasion right in the, uh, the chat box. All right, you got a natural 20. Uh, what are you persuading him? Because he fucking believes it. <laughs> <laughs> um, that I have no idea what's going on and that he should let me. All right. I understand you don't know what's going on. Maybe they betrayed you uh, because why were you knocked out? No one at the party or festival even encountered you. So no one knows why you were knocked out. I can believe you there, but I'm not going to let you go because I still got some some questions. So by all means, I'm going to stop hurting you. But if you got more information, I would like to hear it. So do you know who those two people were? I don't. I don't know anything. Okay. Do you know what their goal was? I love you. You gotta know something. Why? Why did they dare? Why did they drag you along? The Underdark is uh, about a month's travel away. It was a hate crime. It was a hate crime. <laughs> <laughs> How do they hate on their own kind? Wouldn't understand. Kind of dark elf. Did did you murder the two clerics from Pelor? We are we have a very very mad paladin from Eden who is hell bent on hanging you by the neck because he thinks that you and your friends murdered his clerics. Did you murder him? I didn't do anything. Sounds like that's his own problem. <laughs> You understand if I don't get anything out of you, the King's Guard are on their way trying to figure out what happened because everything is going up to hell. And if they get here and I can't vouch for you, they're going to kill you. They're going to tie you to the back of their horse and they're going to drag you till you die. Sounds like fun to me. All right. Well, then I guess that's going to be a day. Uh, you enjoy yourself in there. Let me just go ahead and make sure these knots are real tight on those wrists. And he he ties these things up so hard that you are burning. Like, they gave you the meanest Indian rug burn on your forearms that you've ever had. And up on top of that, he decides to take the blinds off the window. And now the sun is directly in your eyes. He is so pissed off at you. You now have disadvantage on all kinds of persuasion checks, and you're burning. You're physically burning. Uh, I'm going to make it to, at, at this point, because the suns are, are the way they are. Um, if you don't find cover within a couple hours, it will start to do damage to you, because the, the sun is directly in your eyes, and you have no means to cover your eyes. It says, if you have any other information, you know, names of who those people were, what their goal is, what their goal was, what they did, where they went to, just tell me so I can help you. If you don't help me and yourself, you'll probably die. Good luck so, with that. Okay. He he leaves the room. Um, you At this point, you're by yourself. Your hands are tied up. Um, and you, you can tell he's a little pissed. Um, you're slightly injured. I mean, your face got rocked hard by his plate gauntlet that he pin slapped you with. Um, and you can't move your hands at all. Um, what do you do? 
Um, I want to roll for survival. Survival? Mm-hmm. Uh, survival's uh, a lot like uh, you're trying to find food in the wilderness. Um, so that that's just like, you know, how much rations of food are you going to hunt for today? So um, I don't think that'll work. Well, what are you trying to do? I'm trying to figure out a way to break out of the... Uh... Okay, roll an investigation check with disadvantage. You have no idea how to get out. <laughs> Another net one, my favorite. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You, you you look around. You like you you try to feel your hands, and like you can't move your hands an inch. At this point, he wrapped those so tight that you're losing sensation in hands. You start getting that numb feeling because he tied them so tight. He's been gone for about an hour, and the suns. The way the world works is the right now the blue sun sets first and the red sun falls after the blue sun is a little bit easier on your eyes but the red sun is much worse and the blue sun is about to start cresting uh, which means the red sun is about to follow right behind it and that means in about an hour you're going to be in some serious pain uh, but you're sore um, you're at about 14 health left um, and he's been gone for about 30 minutes um, you do anything else um, I want to roll for acrobatics. Acrobatics. Okay, roll. And um, go ahead and give me disadvantage too because you are tied up. All right, you rolled a 13. Uh, what were you trying to do? I'm trying to climb up the All right, so you managed to wiggle your way up to a standing point, um, but your hands are still tied, but you're standing now. About 10 minutes go by, uh, so it's been about 45 minutes now. All right, so, um, at, hey, okay. hey. Um, I'm gonna roll investigation. Okay, uh, disadvantage again, because there's sun bright in your eyes. Disadvantage, okay. Um, so around the room, you notice um, that there's a couple jail cells. Um, right now, with, with that, you're able to kind of squint your eyes and make out that there is a, a, a keychain and a wooden chest. Now, it's out. It's very out of reach. It's about 12 feet away from you. So even if you kick, you're not going to be able to get the keys. Um, but you do notice that the door's lock is a very medieval lock. It's kind of just like a latch. So if you lift it up, um, you'll be able to get in. Um, so there's nothing stopping you if you can get free to get out. Um, and you see that there is some general chests uh, right next to the desk, um, you know, right underneath the keys. So there's a keys uh, chest and then a desk right next to it. Um, you notice that almost all of your personal belongings, except for your clothes, are in there. Um, obviously, what you're wearing is still on you, but your your daggers are in there, um, books are in there. Um, so that's basically what you see in this room uh, there's about three open windows it's kind of a small maybe 30 by 20 feet building but there's about three windows and they're all on the front and they're all open shining in your face so um, after careful looking around the room it's been about an hour and you can hear faint uh, like hoof beats in the distance uh, there is like maybe 10 to 12 horses in the distance and you can tell that they're getting closer um so what do you do arcana arcana mm -hmm. what kind of man oh uh, i mean that's like a knowledge of magic so what are you trying to look up i don't know it's just like Like the force. I know. All right, uh, you, you can roll an arcana check. You can roll it normal. What what does performance do? Uh, performance is like uh, bard stuff. You know, like how well that you acted out something. Like think of charades. Mm. Well. She, she wants to know what would sleight of hand do right here. Um, sleight of hand, uh, you would. It, let's say you roll a high enough roll, um, you might be able to wiggle out of the bonds, but it, you're going to be at a disadvantage, and it's going to be a near impossible roll. 
Um, you basically have to roll almost like two nat 20s because you're in a tight spot. So you, you roll a sleight of hand for me. And I'll do um, disadvantage. I want to roll an investigation to see if there's anything on me that would help me break um, so with the previous investigation check, I'm going to allow you to know all that too. Um, there's nothing on you. Uh, you are okay. robe, belt, pants, and hood. Okay. Um, then can I roll an investigation check to see if there is a splinter in the wood that I could maybe cut the ropes off? Oh yeah, sure. Um, so you notice uh, with the previous investigation roll that it's a fairly um, smoothed out wooden beam. Um, you you could tell that if if you manage to. You know, like sit down and stand up like you would know after a while you would break your bonds because the wood is splintered but it's not to the point where there's an easy splinter to just cut the bonds um the sheriff would know better because he does this all the time but if you if you had time then you would certainly be able to break him i'm gonna roll side of hand okay uh go ahead and give that to me with the disadvantage all right so we got a 13 so you are able to wiggle your arms, um, but you you have some reach, but you can't pull your wrist up enough to grab the loops of the knot. So you can really only kind of finger and thumb a couple ropes behind your back, but not enough to really get out of them. Um, at, at this point, it's been about an hour. You've been trying to investigate, trying to figure out a way out of there um, in desperation. Um, the door slams open, and there's a new figure there. Right behind him is the previous guard that you're speaking with, uh, Mr. Knorr. He says, Lieutenant Briggs, you made good time. Right here is our, uh, this is our dark elf that we've been investigating. Uh, no, you're lucky uh, we were in lively collecting taxes when your rider came through. The town's a mess. What in blazes happened to Knorr? Look. Donning, Donning's been killed. I, I, I don't know what to tell you. What in the light blazes? Donning's been killed? And at this point, he looks at you, and there's a fire in his eyes. Um, he, You see about 12 to 15 knights behind him. Uh, you did notice that there's a, about a dozen like like uh, horses, um, but there, there's several knights, and there's squires behind them, too. They're all fully plated, uh, very polished suits of armor, gold trimmed. And feathered, um, you know, human like gold trimmed and feathered. Of course, they're all humans uh, for the most part. Uh, most are human males. Uh, there's a, a one female within the bunch, um, and unfortunately, the human kingdom at this point, um, the knights guard are generally males. Uh, now, you don't have a sense that you're in danger of dying, but you might get bruised a little bit. What do we have here? We got a, a drow above ground, do we? Yes, sir. Uh, she doesn't know much, but uh, we expect that she may have been part of it. She hasn't really been talking that much. Um, Loth made her move this year and destroyed the Pillar of Peace. Magic, once again, will roam this land. At that point, you you realize what he said was Loth made her move. You, you would know Loth as... Uh, like basically the spider goddess, um, the goddess of the Dro people. Um, you would know that her pendant is a pen, uh, is a spider, um, and you know that your two colleagues that you you walked down from the Underdark with, Zelindra and Zestra, were both priestesses of Loth. So as much as you know, you you know that they work for Loth, and you know that these guards have now said that Loth made their move and destroyed the world. Um so Lieutenant Briggs looks at you. You! And he walks to you and picks you up by your shirt and lifts you up to the top of the pillar. And your your straps pull up with you and you you get splintered. And now Hardy drags you up this pillar. Why shouldn't we just kill you now? Sir, we could use her. If magic is back, we need all the help we can get. I think she wasn't part of it, but I think she was connected to it. You didn't hear me right. You remember the old stories, right? We must pray to Pelor that the god of magic must remain dormant. She can help us, I promise you. At this point, Lieutenant Briggs, he's also got a handlebar mustache. They strangely look like they're like siblings, and he is just stroking that mustache with one hand and holding you up by your shirt with the other. 
Are you sure she wasn't behind it? Sir, I can be certain, but why would they leave behind one of their own to be found? I can put her to work. We have plenty of jobs to do, uh, but it's going to be hard because she is not talking. <laughs> Lieutenant Briggs drops you. Um, nameless. Uh, he turns away from you, just walks away. You... He doesn't really care about you at this point anymore. He pays attention to um, Anor, um, you know, the original guard. My men are yours for the week. Uh, now, Sheriff Anor, I'll be in the tavern if you need me. Find a suitable party to take care of this nameless and try to figure out what she knows. Uh, but it, whatever you need, my men are yours. And see to it that if she tries to run, kill her. And Lieutenant Briggs now walks out of the of the um, jail and motions a few knights to post at the door. So now there's a Nor and two knights. Uh, one of the one female knight that we mentioned, she appears to be more high ranked um, because she's not wearing a, a helmet and she does have a few badges on her. So you can tell that she's higher ranked, um, but obviously not as high ranked as Lieutenant Briggs because she took his orders. I do apologize about his rude behavior, but that sells it. We'll put you to work. Uh, I don't quite trust you yet, but I, I, I think I can find a few champions from the bar to maybe help you out and uh, see if we can put you to work, see if we can start trusting you. You said you didn't know anything at all you could tell me right now. I say nothing. You only make this much harder for yourself. Uh, now, you got to think about the situation. You came here with these two droll women who knocked you out, potentially framed you for the sheriff's murder, the two clerics' murder. You said you don't know anything about it. I believe you. But you have to understand that if I let you out of here, there's a good chance that one of the citizens are going to try to kill you unless I know for sure what's going on so the more you tell me, the better it's going to be for you. You can let them try to kill me. It doesn't work. All right. I want you to know that these men work the fields. Very muscular. They can handle themselves. Um, and we got it. We got guards posted around everywhere. I will go ahead and try to see if I can get some, uh, some party members for you, per se, to put you to work and try to get some more out of you. Okay? So... I'll be right back, and uh, don't think about leaving. Uh, these two knights are on orders to kill you, and uh, they can kill you. And at this point, uh, Sheriff Renor, he walks out and leaves you. Uh, he goes to the tavern where we now have our other adventurers um, who are inside the tavern. Uh, Gregor is uh, sadly drinking at the bar by himself. Um, you have Thorin, Kerbag, and Serenity all sitting in back booth by themselves, but generally those are the only four people in the bar plus Lieutenant Briggs who is flirting with Mira. Um, now, Anor walks into the bar and sits right by Lieutenant Briggs, doesn't really do much, um, but he kind of motions for Gregor to come over to him. Um, quick question. Are we supposed to see the bar right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a like, you can see everything from everywhere in this bar. Oh, no, I meant like an actual map. Oh, um, yeah. Let me pull that up for us. <clears throat> can Kerbeck be playing a funeral song? <laughs> yeah, you, you could be doing a little song. On his bagpipes. <laughs> Uh, One second. I know I have this somewhere. Oh, that's because I'm the wrong one. I'm assuming that this is a black screen for you guys. Mm -hmm. 
So let's go ahead. I'm just going to minimize one thing real quick, and I'm going to get you guys around the bar so you guys can see what's going on. So we got Kerbag, we got <laughs> Gregor, sadly over here by himself. We got Serenity, and we got Thorn. What? Where? Where's the turtle? Oh, oh, turtle. Where? No, I'm not. All right, so it's up here. everyone can pretty much see everything that they need to see from here. Um, so you basically you have uh, over, over by the bar. You have both Sheriff Anor and Lieutenant Briggs kind of Where? sitting down talking to each other, and Mira is on the other side, uh, just kind of making drinks and uh, not not trying to flirt back with Lieutenant Briggs, but. Um, politely accepting his gestures. <coughs> and so Sheriff Renor kind of waves you over to the bar, Gregor. He, he's, he, he, he needs to tell you something. You've been working with him for the past uh, day or so trying to figure out what happened to your clerics. What is What is what? Oh, oh sorry. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, good deal. Yeah. So... We don't think that she killed those clerics, but certainly we still believe that those other two might have. She doesn't know much. I, I suspect that she's been betrayed by her own kind. Those those dark elves are are mean sons of bitches. Uh, they will betray each other. You know, if you know the stories from the Underdark, you know that they'll completely slaughter thousands of another house just to get higher up on a ranking board. Now, I believe that she was betrayed, but she doesn't even know it. Um, and I'm trying to figure out if we can get some men together to maybe put her to some work. We got some issues going on right now. As you, as you know it, magic is coming back. Unfortunately, we've had some rumors of um, some strange things going on on the roads and in the forest. And I don't have enough men um, to take care of that. As you know, some of my men were killed in that, um, that building, uh, collapsing, Declan's departure. And then my sheriff was killed by the woods. So I need some men and some women to work with me and, and help out with some issues. And I was thinking if you guys could be so kind to of babysit our dark elf. Babysit? Babysit? Yeah. I will not babysit a dark elf, a dro. Look, here's what, here's what my line is to you, Gregor. If she knows who killed though your clerics and why, the only way you'll find out is by getting her to talk. Now, she's not talking to me. She will freeze to you, and I think I'll kill her before I get her to talk because I don't got no patience with that. But let's say that I need you guys to take out some bandits on the roads and you take her with you. Maybe she'll open up to you guys. Why would I bring somebody with us that is not only a potential criminal? <laughs> that was the dog. <laughs> pet the dog. Pet the dog. I rolled a pet the dog. Look, I understand your predicament. I can't keep her tied up in that jail because I, again, don't have men to man the jail. I'm going to have the King's Guard for about a week or so, uh, but when they're gone, uh, there's no way I can keep an eye on her while trying to post every man on every single road, patrol the forests, and keep civility in the settlement. So I need someone to either get rid of her or for her uh, to maybe open up and become an ally because we need more allies. Will she be binded? Oh, she will be binded. Well, at first, she will be binded like a hog, and we'll use her as needed. All right, so if I understand it, you got a horse. We can give you a horse to bind her to, and one that she, that will not ride to her command. So you can hog tire to this horse. And then I need you guys to clear out some bandits out of it and killing a couple merchants. Uh, there, there, there's some rumors that they're hunting magical artifacts. Um, now that random items in the world are becoming magical again, you don't know if uh, you know Tom or Sally walking down the road have a magical item or not. So they're 
killing all kinds of travelers, and I need someone to take care of those bandits for me. Hey. Do you like that response? <laughs> My dog. Uh, does Kurt bag overhear this conversation and surrender? Oh, it's, it's, it's plenty loud, yeah. They, I mean, you guys are the only people in the bar plus those two, so you can hear every single word. Okay, so I would like Kurt bag to go over there and make a proposal. All right. All right. Boop, boop. <laughs> so he walks up to the dwarf, and he's kind of angry because it's a dwarf. So he says two things to the dwarf, or one thing to the dwarf. I'll accept your offer on one condition. And what is your condition? I get to kick you. If you kick me, I'll put an arrow between your eyes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, didn't think this through. Um. <laughs> Rango looks <laughs> at Kerbag and exclaims, I'll let you kick the elf. <gasps> Sorry, it looks like those lights have been. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Uh, Kerbag looks at the paladin and says, Deal! Great. Alright, so let me get it straight. We're gonna hog tire, and then uh, big old Granny here is, is going to kick the elf. I don't mind that. If she's giving you issues, rough her up a bit. Um, she ain't talking. Oh, and, uh, yeah, just go ahead. So, Serenity would like to interject walking over to the group. Serenity would then say, Guys, we've all been dealing with some really bad things lately. I think that we should all try to get along for the greater good. And maybe not just kick the, you know, kick the person who's going to give us information eventually. Hopefully, I'm going to come along to keep you guys sane and to not kick everybody. All of a sudden, Gregor turns to Serenity and says, "By the sun, you shall be our peacekeeper." <laughs> All right, so uh, uh, Anor kind of looks over. Um, again, there's Thorin, uh, the dwarf that was with you guys, representing the Lord of Earth. Um, it sounds like that we got the four of you together uh, in a party, per se, who can take this Dark Elf, kill those bandits, and then try to get information out of the Dark Elf for me. Is that what I'm hearing? Uh, only if need be. Only if need be. Now I can keep yep. her. If I, yeah, I can keep her in there. But if she doesn't give me information, I'll kill her. And uh, Lieutenant Briggs is over there. He's getting drunk out of his mind. I'll kill her. I'll say she, she did too much. Look at everything. This town's a mess. I'll kill her if she doesn't give me anything within a week. <laughs> Greg Moore draws his weapon not aggressively to make everybody worry. Gregor takes his blade and points it towards the nearest window that has light coming through it. All right. Basically the sun. And says, we shall find these bandits. We shall find these artifacts. And we shall put the evil at rest. Uh, after he says that, Kerbag asks the small dwarf, are there any gnomes with these bandits? Look, if, if you have to, this is Nora speaking, if you have to kick a gnome, and that would be our local potions keeper, I am going to warn you that he is much beyond your capacity, he will kill you. Um, and that is with a snap of his fingers, because he can just explode you, okay? I would recommend you not do that. But I was talking about the bandit party! Oh, yeah, okay, my bad. Alright, <laughs> rewind. <laughs> Racist motherfucker. 
what I'm what I'm imploring you to do is kill the bandits. Uh, so if there's a gnome or a dwarf in there, by all means, you can kill them too. I do not discriminate when it comes to bandits. I must kill them. Kurt back agrees to this, but he gets to loot the corpses. By all means, I will give you guys some coin for reward. That will get you guys some nice, uh, you know, whatever you want in town, whether you want to go get upgrades for your gear, if you want to go shop around with our local uh, potions merchant. I hear that he's been coming across some magical items. I can give you some gold that might help you in purchasing some of these magical items. But you can keep all the loot. I just want those bandits gone within a week. Gregor looks at Kerbag after he says that he will loot these corpses and exclaims, You will not loot these corpses, at least until their bodies and their souls have been lifted. <laughs> Kerbag looks at Gregor. I'll arm wrestle you for it. Alright, um, if you guys are going to arm wrestle, then I need opposing d20s. With, uh, sh <laughs> with your strength modifier. Alright, so, I'm at the roll here then. Uh, how do I bet? Ability check? So if you click your name, like Gregor, and then click your strength, well... No, that's not it. If you click the word strength, you should be able to do ability check, and then just roll normal. Fuck it. <laughs> 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 wins that arm wrestle. <laughs> By <a> hair. <laughs> Two out of three? <laughs> no, I won fair and square. <laughs> Alright, now that you guys have measured uh, arm size and compared it with each other, um, <laughs> so, again, the parameters are this. You guys get these bandits off my roads within a week. You can keep all of the loot that you find from him, and I'll throw in some gold on the side. That should be enough for you guys to shop with the local townskeepers and shops and get yourself a nice reward. You guys take the Dark Elf with you, and we call it even. Alright. Uh, Kerbex says, alright. But I get no horse. I walk alone. Er, I walk with all my feet, not alone, excuse me. Alright, I wasn't going to give you a horse anyway. Good. <laughs> Gregor turns to Kerbag. Good, he says. Serenity says to the group, I'm in. All right. Gregor turns to... So, it looks like, if, if I'm not mistaken, oh, oh, with, with the dwarf saying okay, then we got ourselves a little fellowship over here. And you guys are going to do great things, huh? And Thorne looks over at Anor and he says, Oh, God damn it. I guess I'm just going to I'm just gonna go along with this. Um, you don't get to kick me, okay, you fucking big green orc? <laughs> You'll see about that. All right. With that nod of approval from Thorne, Serenity, Gregor, and Kerbag, that is going to end today's episode, uh, today's session where we are going to leave off for another couple weeks, where next session we are going to now go hunt bandits and try to figure out if Nameless will become more friendly or not. Mm -hmm.